When Alex and I first saw the listing for our new home, we couldn't believe our luck. A sprawling 1920s farmhouse, nestled on the outskirts of town, priced as if it were begging for buyers. The real estate agent had mentioned a motivated seller, but as we drove down the long gravel driveway lined with ancient oaks, it felt more like a hidden gem than a desperate sale. The house sat on a slight hill, its white paint faded to a ghostly gray, shutters hanging a touch askew. There was an undeniable charm to it, a story waiting to be told. It's perfect, Alex had whispered, squeezing my hand with a grin as wide as the horizon beyond our new backyard. I returned his smile, my heart swelling with dreams of what could be. In the first few days of renovation, it became a game to peel back the layers of the house's past. Underneath wallpaper that bloomed with faded roses, we found hints of its century-old skeleton, horsehair plaster, lathe walls, and yes, even peeling lead paint. Each discovery was met with a mix of excitement and mild concern. They sure don't make them like they used to, Alex joked as he pried up floorboards, revealing asbestos tiles beneath. We laughed it off, caught up in visions of restoring the home to its former glory. But as we tore down old paneling and sanded floors, an unsettling silence settled over the house. It was as if the walls were holding their breath, watching us with the weary eyes of the past. Evenings were the eeriest. The wind whispered through the cracks, carrying the cold and lonely sounds of the countryside. We should have felt isolated, maybe even scared, but we were too enamored with our project, too wrapped up in the potential of our new life to heed the silent warnings. Little did we know, the real story of our home was buried, not in its walls, but in the ground beneath it. As the renovations progressed, so did an inexplicable feeling of incomfort. At first, Alex and I chalked it up to the long hours and dust clouds billowing from our work. Coughs and headaches became our constant, uninvited companions, and nights were restless with a fatigue that seemed too heavy for our youthful bodies. It's just the stress, I muttered one evening, rubbing my temples as Alex nodded, his eyes red from more than just the dust. <laughs> our concerns spilled over during a trip to the local hardware store, where we hoped to find solace in conversation and practical advice. As we listed our symptoms to the elderly store owner, Mr. Jenkins, his face grew increasingly darker. You know, this land wasn't always just farmland, he began, his voice lowering. Back in the day, it was all industrial. Plants and factories, some of them not too careful with what they left behind. His words hung in the air, heavier than the humid summer heat. With a grave look, he added, might want to check your soil before going any further just to be safe. His advice felt like a cold splash of reality. On our drive home, the countryside didn't seem quite as charming. Each rusted farm tool and overgrown field appeared as a testament to a forgotten, possibly sinister past. Taking Mr. Jenkins's warning to heart, Alex and I arranged for environmental specialists to test the soil surrounding our home. The waiting was agony, filled with unease and whispered fears. When the results finally came, they confirmed our worst fears. High levels of lead were just the beginning. The reports also detailed a slew of other industrial toxins, including a mysterious compound that the specialists couldn't immediately identify. Could this be why the house was so cheap? Alex asked, voice tight with anxiety. The question loomed large in the dusty air of our unfinished living room, unanswered, but increasingly obvious. Our dream home was turning into a nightmare and the ground beneath it held secrets that were literally surfacing in our lives. Filled with a growing sense of duty, Alex and I organized a community meeting at the local town hall. We felt it was critical to share what we'd uncovered, fearing the scope of the contamination might extend beyond the borders of our property. The turnout was more significant than we had anticipated, with faces old and young reflecting a mix of curiosity and concern. As we presented our findings, the room's atmosphere thickened with tension and disbelief. After our presentation, a longtime resident, Mrs. Harrow, stood up. Her voice trembled as she recounted how her husband had succumbed to a mysterious illness years ago, one that doctors couldn't quite explain. One by one, others shared similar stories of chronic illnesses, unexplained ailments, and even deaths. The pattern was chilling, and a wave of anger and fear swept through the room. The gravity of our situation had just begun to sink in when the real opposition made itself known. The following days turned darker, 
It started with an anonymous letter slipped under our door, stark against the morning light. Stop digging where you don't belong. Dismissing it as a scare tactic, we tried to press on, but when our car was found with its tires slashed and a warning scratched into the paint, the message was clear. The worst came when our beloved dog Buster didn't come home one evening. We searched everywhere, our calls growing frantic as night fell. He was more than a pet. He was family, and his disappearance left a hollow fear in our hearts. The message was unmistakable. Someone powerful wanted us to back down, and they were willing to hurt us to make it happen. Despite the shadow of threats that loomed over us, Alex and I knew we couldn't retreat into silence. We reached out to the other affected neighbors, forging a coalition of the determined and the wronged. Among our newfound allies was Dr. Elise Moran, a local physician who had long suspected environmental causes behind the peculiar patterns of illness in our community. Together, we began documenting the health impacts systematically, compiling data and personal accounts into a compelling body of evidence. Dr. Moran organized health screenings, and her findings were stark. There's a clear link between these symptoms and the toxins you found, she confirmed during one of our strategy meetings. Her professional affirmation galvanized the group, and our mission felt more justified than ever. We weren't just fighting for our property values or peace of mind anymore. This was about our very lives. Our efforts culminated in another community meeting, this time charged with the urgency of our findings. The hall was packed, the air crackling with tension and anticipation. Midway through the meeting, as another resident shared a particularly emotional testimony, a heated exchange broke out on the floor. Accusations flew, fingers pointed, and in that heated moment, a startling revelation surfaced. Mark, a member of the community board, was exposed for his clandestine communications with BioCore, the corporation suspected of the initial pollution. Emails leaked by an anonymous source revealed his attempts to downplay our concerns and mislead the investigation. The betrayal was a harsh blow, shattering the fragile trust within our ranks. The room erupted into chaos, voices raised not only in anger but also in betrayal and fear. Yet as the initial shock faded, a resolute determination settled among us. Mark's treachery, rather than deterring us, only bound us closer together. With the mole revealed, we knew the lengths to which our adversaries would go. It was a declaration of war against our community's health and future, and we were more determined than ever to fight back. Our opportunity came when a whistleblower from BioCorp, moved by our plight and disgusted by the company's disregard for human life, reached out to us. She provided damning documents and emails that detailed decades of illegal dumping and deliberate cover-up of the contamination. Armed with this irrefutable evidence, we approached a seasoned environmental lawyer who specialized in corporate malfeasance. He was appalled by the extent of the wrongdoing and took on our case with a fervent zeal. Simultaneously, we contacted Carla Mendez, a tenacious local journalist known for her investigative prowess. When she published the first article detailing our story, complete with leaked documents and personal accounts, it sent shockwaves throughout the state. The media exposure was immediate and overwhelming. Other news outlets picked up the story, amplifying our plight into a national scandal. Public outcry grew, forcing regulatory bodies to step in. As the legal proceedings began, BioCorp faced mounting pressure from all sides. The evidence was too compelling, the public and legal scrutiny too intense for them to escape accountability. After months of grueling legal battles, the case concluded with a substantial victory for our community. BioCorp was ordered to pay a significant settlement to the affected residents, acknowledging their decades of suffering. Furthermore, the court mandated a comprehensive cleanup of the area. Funded by the corporation, but overseen by state environmental agencies to ensure compliance and transparency. As the news of the settlement broke, our community felt a collective relief. There was a sense of vindication, of justice finally being served after years of silent suffering. While the scars of our ordeal would remain, the resolution brought hope. We had not only secured a safer environment, but it also affirmed the power of community resilience and the impact of standing united against seemingly insurmountable odds. I remember the day we moved into our dream house clearly. It was a sunny morning, the kind that promised new beginnings. My wife Laura and our two kids, Mia and Jack, were buzzing with excitement as we pulled into the driveway of our brand new home. It was everything we had hoped for. 
a spacious modern design nestled in a friendly suburb. We spent that first day unpacking boxes, arranging furniture, and exploring every corner of our new abode, laughter and chatter filling the air. As night fell on our first evening, the house began to settle, and the initial euphoria of the day gave way to tired satisfaction. We tucked Mia and Jack into their new rooms, kissed them goodnight, and retreated to our bedroom, eager for a restful sleep. But as we lay in the darkness, a faint noise drifted through the silence. It was a soft, unsettling scratching, followed by occasional thumping, as if something, or someone, was moving within the walls. At first I thought it was just the house settling, as new houses often do. But as the sounds continued, night after night, it became clear that something was not right. This was no ordinary settling. These were noises with intent, a secret held within the walls of our perfect new home. A week into our new life, the strange noises became an unsettling routine. However, it was Mia, our curious eight-year-old, who unintentionally deepened the mystery. While chasing a runaway marble in her room, she stumbled upon a loose floorboard. With a mix of childlike excitement and naivety, she beckoned us over to reveal her discovery. Hidden beneath the board were a stack of old, faded photographs and a bundle of letters, yellowed with age. The photos showed a woman with a gentle smile, her eyes reflecting a somber story yet to be told. The letters were even more intriguing, penned with a desperate hand that detailed loneliness and subtle fear. They weren't dated, but the wear suggested they were old. Our initial excitement about uncovering a piece of forgotten history quickly turned into concern as we pieced together who these might belong to. The architect's wife, who had mysteriously vanished years before our house was built. The news had been a small town legend, one that chilled newcomers and reminded locals of unresolved shadows. Driven by a mixture of concern and curiosity, we decided to look for more clues. Our search led to the discovery of additional hidden compartments throughout the house. Each contained more personal items, a worn out scarf, a broken watch, a diary with several pages torn out. It seemed every room had its own secret stash, each revealing fragments of a life that whispered tales of distress and perhaps foul play. The implications of our findings were profound. With each new discovery, our initial joy turned into a solemn resolve to uncover the truth. What started as a family adventure was now a serious investigation into the fate of the missing woman whose life had unknowingly intertwined with ours. We couldn't ignore the pressing questions. Who was she really? What had happened to her? And why were her belongings sealed away behind the walls of our home? As days turned into weeks, the atmosphere within our house shifted from curious to unsettling. It wasn't just the hidden compartments that fed our growing unease. Strange occurrences began to pile up, adding layers of fear to our daily lives. Tools from the garage began to vanish, only to reappear in bizarre locations, under beds, in closets, places we had already searched. Our dog, a typically jovial golden retriever, developed a sudden aversion to certain walls, whining and pacing nervously whenever he approached them. The most disturbing aspect, however, was the sensation of being watched. At night, the feeling intensified, a tangible presence that loomed just beyond the reach of our bedside lamps. Seeking explanations, I reached out to our neighbors and the local police. The community's reaction was a mix of sympathy and evasion. While some neighbors offered friendly advice and shared their own minor grievances with new homes, there was a palpable reluctance to discuss anything in depth about the house or its history. The local police were more forthright, albeit in a way that did little to ease our minds. They advised us to focus on settling into our new life and refrain from dredging up a past that could not be changed. Their stern warnings to leave things alone only fueled our suspicions that something more sinister was at play. This lack of support from the community only isolated us further. We were left to grapple with the mystery alone, every unexplained noise and missing item a reminder that we had stumbled upon something no one wanted uncovered. The walls of our dream home, once symbols of a new beginning, now felt like barriers trapping us with secrets too dangerous to disturb. Our resolve hardened, not just to solve these mysteries for our own sake, but to bring to light whatever was meant to stay hidden. Determined to uncover the truth, 
we contacted a retired detective who had been marginally involved in the initial investigation of the architect's missing wife. Over coffee, he confessed that he had always harbored suspicions about the architect, but lacked the evidence to prove anything substantive. His belief was that the disappearance was not merely a missing person case, but something more nefarious, possibly even murder. Armed with this new ally and his insights, we returned to our home, more resolved than ever. It was during a thorough search behind the living room's fireplace, a place we had overlooked before, that we made a groundbreaking discovery, a hidden diary. This diary, meticulously kept and painfully honest, detailed the missing woman's fears about her husband's temper and her plans to leave him. It was the definitive proof we needed, a written testament to the fear she lived in and her husband's potential motive. With the diary in hand, we confronted the architect at the annual community fair. The public setting was deliberate, chosen to prevent him from evading the questions as he had done in the past. As we approached him, diary in hand, his face drained of color. Before he could dismiss us, I began reading excerpts aloud. The crowd's murmurs grew louder with each revealed secret. The tension broke when the police, who had been discreetly informed and were waiting in the wings, stepped forward. Faced with the undeniable evidence and the eyes of the community upon him, the architect broke down and confessed to the crime. His arrest followed swiftly, bringing an abrupt end to the ordeal as the fairground buzzed with the shock of the revelation. The truth, long buried within the walls of our home, was finally out. We decided to stay in the house, confronting and overcoming our fears of its haunted past. Plans were made to renovate, not just to repair but to transform and reclaim. We tore down the old walls and built new ones. Each stroke of the hammer, a cathartic release from the shadows that had lurked behind them. The day I stepped into the house Elias built, I was awash with a sense of achievement and wonder. He wasn't just my mentor. In the world of architecture, he was akin to a deity. His final gift to me, this house, was a testament to his genius and innovation. I was ready to start a new chapter of my life within its walls blissfully unaware of the intricate web I was about to entangle myself in. Before Elias became an enigma, he was a visionary whose passion for architecture knew no bounds. We met on a rain-soaked afternoon at a lecture hall, where his ideas about buildings as living entities first captured my imagination. Architecture, he said, his eyes alight with fervor, is the silent witness to our lives, shaping us as much as we shape it. Our ensuing mentorship was not merely an exchange of knowledge but of dreams and doubts. As his final project loomed, Elias grew distant, consumed by his creation. This house was his magnum opus, a secret even to me until his last breath revealed its existence. Understanding his isolation now, amidst his architectural legacy, I see the brilliance and madness that danced in tandem within his mind. The exterior of the house was a spectacle of modern design, a harmonious blend of glass and steel that seemed to dance with the surrounding wilderness. Inside, it was an embodiment of light, with walls that shifted and floors that seemed to breathe. It was a living entity, a marvel of technology and design that promised a utopia. But the marvel began to morph into a mystery. The first sign was subtle. A chair I remembered pushing in was found pulled out the next morning. I shrugged it off as forgetfulness. But then, the anomalies grew harder to ignore. Rooms I left set for breakfast greeted me rearranged for dinner. Doors I had left ajar were found firmly locked, and windows that once offered a view of the dawn now reflected only the night. Driven by a mix of curiosity and unease, I scoured the house for answers. It was in a concealed niche behind a seemingly ordinary bookshelf in the library that I found Elias's journals. They were filled with his thoughts on architecture's potential, not just to shelter, but to influence, to control. The house, his crowning achievement, was more than a home. It was an experiment in shaping human behavior through design. I was the subject of that experiment. The realization struck me with chilling clarity. My mentor's legacy, this architectural wonder, was a meticulously designed cage. Night after night, the house unveiled its challenges. Corridors twisted into mazes at the flick of a switch. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, taunting me, 
and puzzles embedded in the very fabric of the house tested my resolve. Ilias's game was one of endurance, of psychological warfare. The house seemed to mock me with its shifting shadows, a silent challenger to my resolve. One evening, as I traced my fingers along the cool, smooth surface of the marble countertop, a sudden chill enveloped the room. The hairs on my neck stood on end, not just from the cold, but from a realization that crept up on me like the shadows that now seemed to linger longer than before. It wasn't just the house that was changing. I was too. Fear, a constant companion, had begun to morph into something else, a gritty determination. I hadn't spoken a word, but the house, in its eerie silence, had heard my unspoken vow. I would not be broken. As days turned into nights within the confines of the house, I discovered a room I hadn't noticed before. It was starkly empty, except for a single antique chessboard set up as if a game was in progress. A note beside it, in Elias's handwriting, challenged me to finish the game. Each move I made triggered changes in the house. Some rooms expanded, offering brief respite or clues, while others contracted, their walls inching closer with a suffocating inevitability. The game became a metaphor for my struggle. Each piece moved a step closer to salvation or doom. One evening, as thunder rumbled ominously outside, the house's lighting system flickered erratically, casting shadows that twisted and stretched in the corners of my vision. In this chaos, I stumbled upon Elias's studio, untouched since his last day. The room was filled with architectural models and drawings, each more fantastical and abstract than the last. Amidst them, I found a model of the house, but with one striking difference. A hidden room marked Elias's sanctuary. My heart raced as I realized this could be the key to understanding the house's secrets. Determined to find this sanctuary, I embarked on a meticulous search, pressing against walls and scouring each room for hidden mechanisms. The breakthrough came unexpectedly. I had noticed a pattern in the shifting walls and, following a hunch, I traced the movements back to their source. A hidden panel in the basement slid away to reveal what I could only describe as the house's nerve center. A room filled with monitors, controls, and blueprints. The architectural heart of Elias's experiment. And there, amidst the tangle of blueprints, was the failsafe. A complex series of switches and buttons that promised liberation. It was Elias's final challenge, a puzzle that required not just architectural insight, but a deep understanding of the man himself. The house did not yield easily. With every step I took towards freedom, it countered with a new, more sinister obstacle. Floors that gave way to reveal depths unknown, walls that closed in, threatening to crush me, and illusions that played on my deepest fears. But I persevered, that architecture was as much about people as it was about buildings. Each puzzle solved brought me closer to the truth, not just about the house, but about the man who built it. Elias had sought to create a legacy that transcended time, but in his quest, he had lost sight of the ethical boundaries that should have guided him. When I finally activated the failsafe, the house shuddered as if in defeat. Doors unlocked, windows cleared, and for the first time in what felt like an eternity, I stepped outside. The world seemed different, as if I was seeing it for the first time again. I had survived Elias's final experiment, but the victory was bittersweet. The house stood silent behind me, a monument to a brilliant mind that had strayed too far into the abyss. I knew then that I couldn't simply walk away. The story of the house, of Elias's brilliance and his fall, needed to be told. I documented everything, publishing the journals, and sharing the tale of the house that sought to control its inhabitant. The house remains, sealed and under study, a cautionary tale of ambition unchecked by morality. And I, forever changed by the experience, dedicated myself to a new cause, promoting ethical architecture. Through a foundation established in Elias's name, I sought to ensure that his brilliance would inspire future generations, but that his mistakes would serve as a reminder of the lines we must not cross. In the aftermath, the house became a part of me, its lessons etched into my soul. It had been a prison, a puzzle, and ultimately, a teacher. Within its walls, I had faced my fears, 
discovered my strength, and learned the true price of legacy. As I move forward, I carry with me the memories of that time, a testament to the power of architecture to shape lives. The house taught me that while we may design the spaces we live in, it is our choices that define us.